Welcome to the show. I have another great show planned for you this week. My guest later on the show will be Zach Zataslo, an attorney at my law firm, Bordis & Bordis. We'll be talking all about workplace injuries, including asbestos claims and recent developments with talcum powder, such as Johnson & Johnson baby powder. But first, we'll start off with some usual, usual features. And I want to start with a quote because uh, it's summertime. I always consider it to be summer when school's out. I consider that to be kind of the official start of summer. And a lot of people consider Memorial Day, and that's kind of another thing, but school went a little later this year because of the work stoppage uh, of the teachers here in West Virginia. So a lot of the kids are just getting out of school. But this quote comes from uh, Earl Wilson, a journalist who said, a vacation is what you take when you can no longer take what you've been taking. And uh, I think there's a lot of the truth to that. A lot of times we do need a vacation ultimately, and it helps kind of re-energize us, uh, recharge the batteries, if you will. And uh, summer is always a good time to do that, especially if, if you have kids when they uh, get a break from school and to maybe take a little trip and uh, come back and then get back to business. So uh, I'm looking forward to it later on this summer, taking a little vacation myself and uh, you know my kids will be as well. But uh, I hope everyone stays safe when they're doing that, uh, no matter where your travels may take you. And I thought this week maybe I'd give some uh, tips uh, for, for driving while on vacation because over the course of years in the, in the practice of law, uh, I've unfortunately uh, represented a number of people who have been involved in uh, crashes when they've been on vacation. And, um, you know, not their fault, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, nothing they could do about it. But some of the things that I've seen other people have done that have caused these crashes, uh, unfortunately, um, thought maybe I'd pass along and uh, maybe help everyone avoid uh, injuring themselves or someone else. So first of all, uh, defensive driving, engaging in defensive driving. We actually had a deposition recently where one uh, individual who was a truck driver said uh, he, he didn't really know what we meant by defensive driving. And of course, that was something I learned back in driver's ed class when I was 15, 16 years old, taking that at uh, Wheeling Park High School with Coach Capisi, one of my favorite classes. I just enjoyed spending time with Coach Capisi, and uh, I think maybe once he even let, it, let me drive through McDonald's when we were doing the, the driving. But uh, anyway, uh, defensive driving, you know, being aware of what's going on around you and alert to anticipate what other drivers might do, the situations that look like they're going to be coming up and, uh, and how you can look and say, I, I can avoid this situation, might be a bad situation here because of what someone else may do. So always engage in defensive driving, be alert and aware of what's going on around you. Uh, next, take breaks when you're driving, especially on long trips. Even if you just take a break for five minutes to, to stop, get out, stretch, uh, maybe use the restroom, uh, grab a snack or whatever it may be, you know, take five minutes and take a break every so often, uh, you know, whether it's every hour or two, uh, and, and really kind of just get yourself uh, off of just staring straight ahead at the roadway and, and then take a little bit of a rest. Next, don't be afraid to use your horn. I mean, so often we use our horn just to kind of uh, honk it and wave at somebody we know, or sometimes you see people using it when they're upset with someone and slamming the horn. The horn's there for a reason. It's to, to alert other drivers to your presence or when something might be about to happen. So don't be afraid when you see, it looks like someone might be changing lanes and they don't realize you're there to use that horn to alert them that you're there. Uh, especially if you might happen to be in that person's blind spot, etc. It's there for a reason. Uh, use hands-free devices uh, when utilizing a phone. You know, if you've got uh, a Bluetooth or some other method in your vehicle, use that. If you're going to use your uh, phone, if you need to use it, uh, don't uh, have your hands off the wheel. Of course, in most states now, that's illegal, uh, but it's also just safe driving to, to make sure that you're using those hands-free devices. And then lastly, familiarize yourself with your route ahead of time, even if you're planning to use GPS. Uh, so many people don't do that. I know back when you know, I was in college and before the, the advent of you know, GPS and, and cell phones, you know, I had to get out a map and see where I was going and I would look ahead and plan my routes and, and know where, where I was headed. Now with GPS, so many people just rely upon that thing in their car to just say the next turn or wherever it may be. And sometimes it doesn't give you a lot of warning that you're supposed to make a turn uh, or what you're gonna be doing next or what's going on. So, uh, it causes people to make sudden exits or sudden turns, things of that nature. If you familiarize yourself with your route ahead of time, then you know when that GPS is going to be telling you that you're going to be turning up somewhere close ahead or you've got a mile to go and then you're going to be getting off the exit, things of that nature. So really spend some time ahead of your trip knowing where you're going to be going, even if you're going to be using GPS while you're on the trip. So hopefully these are some tips that can help make it a little bit safer for you and your family. Um, kind of pulling out my inner Clark Griswold here. Uh, Vacation was one of my favorite movies back in the day. Um, you know, if you run into any uh, Corvettes, uh, you know, uh, try not to be too distracted as you're on the roadways. Um, next up, a little community event. Uh, the Bordis and Bordis Amateur Classic, of course, something uh, near and dear to my heart. First time we've done this, uh, it's, uh, this weekend at Ogilvy. 
This is one of the state's oldest running golf tournaments and uh, Cal Cruth Roofing, who formerly sponsored this tournament, has moved on to another tournament up at Ogilvy that's played over at the uh, Spidell area. And so uh, we have taken over the sponsorship of the event that's held at Crispin each year. And again, one of the oldest uh, golf tournaments in the state. So it's the board, now the Board of Supporters Amateur Golf Classic. And some of the, the region's best golf player, uh, golfers always come in to play in this tournament. And uh, I'm really excited to see how they do and, and what the outcome is. But uh, more importantly, uh, you know, it's going to benefit a, a really good cause, which is the Ogilvy Foundation. That's where the proceeds are going to go. Uh, of course, Ogilvy provides so many opportunities for so many people here in this area and also a uh, very big economic driver here in our area uh, because so many tourists come into Ogilvy each year, all times of year, whether it be in the summer or whether it be for the Winter Festival of Lights. So we're glad that the uh, proceeds are able to benefit the Ogilvy Foundation, which also does a lot of good things such as their access to the parks program, which allows uh, less fortunate children to be able to utilize the parks in the summertime and otherwise. Uh, so if you can, uh, go out maybe watch a little bit of the golf or just follow along. And if uh, you happen to be a, a good player, maybe it's something that you can uh, also participate in, uh, whether it be this year or next year. So good luck to all the participants in that. Uh, we're really excited to sponsor it. We need to take a break. When I come back, I'll have my guest, Zach Zetazola, with me. Stay with us here on The Jamie Bordas Show. When reviewing your oil and gas offers or royalty check statements, do you wonder, am I being offered a fair amount? Do I feel comfortable reading the statement? Do I have peace of mind? If you answered no to these questions, you need Bordas Mineral Management. Our passion is helping mineral owners protect and expand their mineral wealth. Our examiners tell you whether you're being treated fairly and getting paid what is rightfully yours. Bordas Mineral Management. Be protected. Have peace of mind. Recommended by the highest authorities. Danoon Lumber. It's like a bad one's coming. Yeah. Right? Welcome back to the show. This is my favorite time each week when I have a guest with me. And this week, my guest is Zach Zatazla, who's an attorney with my law firm, Abortus and Bordas, and who handles a lot of our workplace injury cases. We're going to be talking a little bit about workplace injuries and also some developments in the arena of asbestos and also talcum powder, which has been really in the news recently. So Zach, I uh, really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Jamie. You it's know, always we, a pleasure. We did this once last summer, but there were some technical glitches and difficulties, so we really didn't get to, to put the show out there. So I thought it'd be great to have you back on again. So I appreciate you taking the time to hey, come out. I'm happy for the opportunity to get it right. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, workplace injuries. You've been practicing law now for nearly two decades. And workplace injuries is something that you've seen a lot of and people may think well you get hurt at work you know you file a workers comp claim that's what you get is workers comp and that, that's true to a large degree you do get that but there are also some ways in which you can recover beyond the workers comp system through what's called a deliberate intent case and people may not be aware of that what that even is right so uh, the idea behind workers comp is it's sort of a trade-off between the employer and the employee uh, if you're hurt on the job as the employee, you don't have to prove that your employer did anything wrong to cause your injuries. The flip side of that is you're typically not allowed to bring uh, a lawsuit against your employer in civil court. But West Virginia is one of a number of states that does recognize an exception for that, and it's typically called deliberate intent. And the idea there is that when an employer uh, knowingly violates a specific safety regulation and um, risks uh, the safety of the worker by, by making them do something that is unsafe and the worker in turn gets hurt, uh, they can bring, in addition to a worker's compensation claim, a civil lawsuit against their employer. You know, I know you've seen cases now where, you know, OSHA uh, is, is a big, you know, regulator or inspector and they come in and you see OSHA violations and uh, in particular with respect to, to factories and plants where you see things like where guards were removed, things of that nature. And what, what are some of the common things that you know, you've seen where uh, you know, that, that perhaps employers have done that have exposed uh, workers to injury that otherwise wouldn't have occurred? Right. One of the things that you mentioned is something that unfortunately we commonly see where guards are removed from machinery in order to um, 
you know, increase the rate of production on a particular assembly line, for instance, and the guards are designed to, to protect people from getting their hands or, or feet or body parts caught in there, and if they're removed, then a lot of times that's, that's what ends up happening. Um, a lot of times, we, we've, well, we've seen other instances where, for instance, uh, employers will make employees work uh, at heights, you know, uh, that are dangerous heights and don't provide them with appropriate fall safety protection, either tie-offs or harnesses, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, we, we still see, unfortunately, a lot of instances where uh, workers are being unwittingly exposed to human health hazards, different chemicals or, um, you know, asbestos is a good, a good example. Um, things that the employer has an understanding that are harmful to human health but uh, are nevertheless putting the employee in harm's way without protecting them or warning them of the dangers. You know, here in West Virginia and of course just across the border in Ohio, but uh, particularly in West Virginia, a lot of coal mining and, uh, you know, we've seen instances over the years where you've already got a uh, really a dangerous job to begin with, being in the coal mine where, where just things can occur, natural things can occur that, are, uh, that can cause injury or or death to someone, but then we see instances where uh, employers have done things too that have additionally exposed coal miners to uh, injury or, or death, and uh, both here in the northern part of the state, and we've also seen that in the southern part of the state, and uh, that's something too where you know, people may not realize, especially sometimes the, the family members of someone who uh, tragically loses their life, that, that there are other methods besides just a workers' comp award. Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen some of the, the most disastrous consequences um, in coal mines where you know, multiple miners have lost their lives. And, and it's important for employees to understand that um, in order to, to have a successful deliberate intent case, one of the things that you have to prove is that the employer violated a specific safety regulation. OSHA and, and the Mine Safety Health Administration, I mean, they impose general duties that on an employer to keep the workplace safe, but that's not good enough for a deliberate intent case. You actually have to prove that they violated a specific regulation either issued by OSHA or MSHA. And that's why it's so important that those organizations be contacted timely, either OSHA or MSHA, when an employee is injured because they'll come in and do the investigation and oftentimes cite the employer for violating those specific statutes or rules or regulations uh, and, and then that evidence can be used in the deliberate intent case to satisfy that particular element. Can anyone contact OSHA, MSHA? I mean, can it, can it be a, a family member or a friend? Or, I mean, can anybody make the contact to let them know, hey, this person was injured? Or? They certainly can. I mean, the employer has an obligation to contact OSHA, typically within 24 hours, depending on the circumstances, especially in the more severe injury cases. But certainly anybody can contact OSHA, be it the employee themselves, family member, friend, coworker. That's important, I think, because you're right. You know, sometimes people don't realize that needs to be done, and it's it's kind of it'd be kind of like having a you know a car crash out there on the roadway and nobody calling the police to to come investigate and make a record of who was at fault and why. I mean, same thing. If you don't contact the the proper the appropriate uh, inspection and regulatory authorities, then you know, that that type of investigation is not done. That's right, and that can oftentimes make it very difficult for uh, an injured employee who is otherwise deserving of compensation to recover. We need to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about workplace injuries and specifically asbestos-related and talcum powder-related injuries. Stay with us here on the Jamie Borda Show. At Ultra Big Bang, we need to be assured you can make your payments. Yes. Well, buy them out. Acquire, acquire. As I was saying, I'm not sure I see the value in your small account. That's when we went to Belmont Savings. They took the time to understand our needs. And they didn't make us feel small. Where the big banks are only interested in growing, Belmont Savings' interest was in us. Belmont Savings Bank, focused on your future. So, how was your first day? Oh, long. So, Josh asked me about you. Daddy's home. Go beat him. For your home, for your life, for more than 50 years. The Hardwood Specialists, the Noon Lumber. Welcome back to the show. I've been speaking with Zach Zataslo, who's an attorney in my law firm of Bordis and Bordis. We've been talking about workplace injuries. And Zach, I want to turn our attention a little bit to a specific type of workplace uh, 
injury, which is asbestos-related injuries. And uh, you know, people hear the term mesothelioma, they may see a lot of uh, commercials, especially on late night TV, from advertising on mesothelioma claims, or if you've been exposed to asbestos, people may think, well, you know, no, I wasn't, but then they get diagnosed with something like mesothelioma, and uh, people may say, what is this mesothelioma? Yeah, so mesothelioma is a particular type of cancer. Uh, it invades the tissues uh, called the mesothelium, which is, um, it's sort of a fibrous lining that we all have in our body that is uh, surrounding all of our organs and sort of holds our, our organs in place. And uh, that can, of course, become infected with asbestos, and uh, which can trigger cancer of that particular tissue and, and cell type. And it's unfortunately a, a terminal cancer for which there is no cure. Um, it is unique in that asbestos is one of, if not the only known cause of mesothelioma. So odds are, if you end up with that diagnosis, and it's, it's a particular diagnosis that, it, it, you know, if it's made, it's, it's done through, uh, you know, a fair amount of uh, pathological investigation and, and uh, good medicine. Uh, but if that's made, then odds are you've been exposed to asbestos somewhere along the way. Yeah, people may think, well, geez, I've never worked in a plant or a factory. You know, how could I have been as exposed to asbestos? But uh, if they get mesothelioma, they have been. And what are some of the ways that somebody that's never worked in a plant or factory could have been exposed? Yeah, a lot of people who lived in households where their parents worked uh, in and around asbestos and brought their clothes home to be laundered, um, people who worked on brakes in their cars, people who may have remodeled their homes at one point and torn down old drywall or roofing shingles, all those products contained asbestos uh, at one time or another. And um, it's not something that people are, are generally aware of, but they, they can be unwittingly exposed even without being in the workplace. So if someone's diagnosed with mesothelioma by their doctor, I mean, okay, so then they know at that point I had to have been exposed to asbestos. I mean, they go to a lawyer, what types of things are done to investigate you know, how they were exposed and when they may have been exposed? Right, so those folks do have claims. Um, they have asbestos claims if they've been diagnosed with a mesothelioma or even sometimes a lung cancer or uh, other types of asbestos-caused diseases. And what typically happens is um, those clients are, are interviewed and a detailed history is taken, not only of them, but of their family members, their coworkers, um, their, their distant relatives sometimes. And typically, you know, what you end up doing is, is you're able to put a picture together that um, shows that, you know, they would have been exposed to uh, various types of asbestos products. And, um, you know, over the years, we, we've learned uh, who were the manufacturers and suppliers of different asbestos products to different types of uh, not only job sites, but uh, different types of products like drywall products or brake products sold by Napa, uh, those types of things. With respect to that, I mean, oftentimes, the, you know, unfortunately, the person, um, they may be still living uh, when, when their case is being handled, but sometimes they pass away even while the case is being handled because it does, you know, as you said, it's a terminal uh, illness uh, when, when someone gets mesothelioma, at least. Uh, and, but the, the people may not know that, you know, the survivors can carry on that claim for them or that case for them in, in the courts. That's right. I mean, the law does allow the estate of a, of a person who passed away uh, because of mesothelioma or, or an asbestos-caused lung cancer to continue on the case in the name of the estate and uh, obtain compensation if they qualify as a, what they call an estate beneficiary, which are typically spouses, children, siblings, parents, those types of folks. I want to turn our attention away from workplace injuries for a moment, and, and let's talk a little bit about talcum powder. I mentioned that, and you know, uh, for example, Johnson and Johnson baby powder. It's been in the news a lot in the last you know six months to a year, especially about the harms that are being caused by this powder. And uh, I know you're familiar with that and have, have uh, been involved in those types of cases. And uh, you know, what can you tell our viewers about uh, what's going on with that? Sure, it's it's interesting. You know, over the course of probably the last four or five years. Um, a lot of the viewers may have seen these, these uh, large verdicts being uh, delivered by juries throughout the country to folks who were um, regular users of talcum powder products. And interestingly enough, uh, the reason for that uh, is that the talcum powder has now been associated with uh, causing ovarian cancer and even more recently mesothelioma. 
Uh, the reason for that is because the talcum powder is contaminated with asbestos. Uh, asbestos and talc are their naturally occurring minerals in the earth, in their mind. And oftentimes, uh, talc and asbestos seams are found commingled and, and uh, right next to one another underground. So um, when the talc is m being mined, a lot of times it's being contaminated with uh, adjacent asbestos seams. And um, that's why we're seeing this increase in cancers uh, from folks that have used these products. And that's, that's a perfect example of another way that somebody may uh, have never worked around asbestos knowingly and yet developed one of these diseases. Uh, most recently, and just in the last two months, there have been uh, two multi-million dollar verdicts for individuals who uh, were contracted mesothelioma from talcum powder. Now, with respect to these, I mean, you know, you mentioned ovarian cancer. Is that the primary disease that uh, we're seeing? You mentioned mesothelioma, of course, also. But aside from that, is, is, is ovarian cancer the primary disease that uh, talcum powder is causing? That's the disease that has to date most strongly been associated with exposure to talcum powder um, through, you know, the scientists and doctors who research the issue. There, uh, there is you know, ongoing work investigating a, a link between exposure to talcum powder and uterine cancer and other type of uh, gynecological cancers. Um, but to date, the, the strongest association has been with the ovarian. And then, of course, you know, more recently now, we've, we've gotten two uh, jury, or we've seen two jury verdicts uh, associating mesothelioma with exposure to talcum powder for folks who never worked in and around asbestos. Well, Zach, I really appreciate you being here on the show. I think it was uh, probably very informative for our viewers with respect to uh, workplace injuries and also with respect to talcum powder. So I thank you for coming. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Well, we need to take a break. When we come back, I'll be talking sports. What's going on with the Pirates? Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. People in nursing homes are some of the most vulnerable members of our society. They're there because they can't take care of themselves. Those facilities have a duty to take care of our loved ones, and when they don't, it's important they're held accountable. We've not only collected record results against negligent nursing homes, but more importantly, we've helped so many families get the answers and closure they so badly needed. Bordas and Bordas, fighting for justice. Welcome back to the show. It's time to talk sports and uh, what is going on with the Pittsburgh Pirates. You know, now hovering back around 500 after a really solid start to the season, in which they were going back and forth from first, second place in that range. And you know, re recall at the beginning of the year, I said the Pirates would surprise people and finish the top two in the division. And the season's still early. We're just in early June here, but boy, have they struggled recently. I mean, just can't seem to do anything right. And you know, now people questioning, you know, not only the the players on the field, but also the manager and you know, you look at it, and it, there have been some head-scratching decisions. I mean, from when to use certain relief pitchers or when to, uh, you know, use certain outfitters. You've got uh, Meadows, who's a young outfielder who was called up from Indianapolis and has been playing really well, but sitting the bench at times when uh, Gregory Polanco is struggling. And you've got just a lot of, you know, really, I would say, chaos right now in terms of no consistency with what the team is doing. When you look at the teams around the league that are, that are, that are performing solidly, you know, th there's a plan. You know, these guys are going to play. You get a lead. This guy's going to come in and pitch the seventh. This guy's going to pitch the eighth. Our closer is going to come in, in the ninth. You know, this is what's going to happen if we're not winning the game. We're not into the, really in position to win the game. These guys aren't going to pitch. And it doesn't seem like there's any real plan right now. Um, you know, maybe they're searching for one. But the, the, the Pirates are going to have to get it figured out in a hurry or they're going to fall way out of this race. You know, it's, I, I think, the, the month of June is perhaps going to be the most critical one of the season for the Pirates. I think by the time the, the month is over, they're, they're going to need to be five games or less 
uh, out of first or, or they're just not going to have a real shot. So hopefully they can, uh, you know, turn, turn some things around here compared to what's been going on the last couple weeks and, and get things straightened out. But uh, it sure doesn't show any signs of that happening anytime soon. So we'll keep an eye on it as, uh, as we continue on. The NBA Finals, of course, right in the middle of that. And, you know, I predicted before the year started it would be Warriors versus Cavs again in the Finals. I said that again when the playoffs started. A lot of people questioned whether that would happen, particularly with respect to the Cleveland Cavaliers. But LeBron James has just been unbelievable in, in, in these playoffs. Of course, you know, the Game 1 performance in these Finals where he had 51 points and then, the, you know, of course, goes to overtime in a game that looked like Cleveland should have won but a missed foul shot by George Hill at the end of the game. Ties the game with the foul shot, then misses, but J.R. Smith gets the rebound with four seconds to go, inexplicably dribbles it back out to half court when he got the rebound right under the bucket. Uh, pretty apparent that he thought they were in the lead. Uh, he denied that in the press conference after the game, said he knew the game was tied, but if you watch what he said to LeBron James, he clearly said, I thought we were ahead. And I said at the time, my daughter and I were watching it, I said, he thinks they're winning. Um, really blew a game that they could have won and would have changed the entire complexion of the series. But, um, you know, the, the big question is what's going to happen in the offseason, the free agency in the NBA. There are going to be a lot of moves, as always, and uh, some contracts up, including LeBron James. But uh, we'll see what happens in the remainder of this series. But uh, as I said before the year started, I, I thought it would be um, Warriors uh, over Cavs. Uh, I'm going to stick with that and say, uh, I said, I've said all along, it'll be Warriors over Cavs in six. Uh, you know, I'll stick with that prediction, even though... Uh, that uh, could happen a little bit sooner than that, perhaps. Oliver Luck making big news. Uh, the former WVU quarterback and athletic director has, accept, has left his job at the NCAA and has accepted a job as the new CEO and commissioner of the XFL, the rebirth of the XFL by Vince McMahon of WWE fame. And uh, the last time the XFL didn't go so well, uh, it was kind of a little bit of, uh, they were going to focus more on the theatrics than the football. They said they're going to focus more on the football this time. And I think they think they could take a real shot at the NFL as the NFL has suffered in popularity with the perhaps lack of patriotism, you may call it, on the part of the players and some other things. So they're going to take a crack at having, a, I think, an eight-team league at first. And, uh, but Oliver Luck said that this was an intriguing position for him and really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So we'll see what he can do. Uh, bright guy, has his law degree. Uh, and, and has served as uh, general manager of a, of a professional soccer team. He's been involved with the NCAA, of course, athletic director at WVU. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what uh, Oliver Luck can do with the XFL. And let's talk golf for a second. Tiger Woods uh, seems to be uh, rounding back into form and, uh, you know, had a good performance last week at the Memorial in Columbus. And I will predict that Tiger Woods will win a major before the summer's up. He's hitting his irons awfully well. If he can get that putter going, which has always been strong for him, uh, Tiger Woods will win a major this summer. That's all the time we have this week. Thanks for joining in. We'll see you again next week on The Jamie Bordas Show.